Okay, we are officially recording. Today is January 14th. Must be. I think all day. January 14th, 2014, and I am here talking with Richard Peterson, who is a World War II veteran. Yes. Richard, thank you for joining us. Um, I'm going to start with some easy questions. Okay. Could you please tell me where and when you were born? Okay. I was born on August 10th, 1917, before World War I, in Broadland, South Dakota, which is a little prairie town just west of uh, Huron. Okay. I forgot to have you. Could you say your own name for me so that I don't have to? My name is Richard Dale Peterson. Perfect. That's exactly what I wanted. So, Richard, you were born in the Dakotas. Did yes. you grow up there? My mother died in the flu epidemic of 1918, which took uh, lots and lots of people. And she was kind of a, a um, do-gooder in the neighborhood for other, pe other people. And, and, and when I was 16 months old, um, she, uh, she died. And uh, that left myself and two older sisters um, without a home, well, with a home, but a, a father. And uh, uh, in the settlement or in the arrangements, I was to go to live with some of the aunts and uncles, uh, the sisters and their husbands of my father. Okay, and where was that? Well, I wound up living in Lynn Grove, Iowa, on a small farm with uh, my father's sister, Tilly, who was one of five girls in the Peterson family, along with, with two uh, ma males that had immigrated from uh, Scandinavia uh, in the late 1980s. So you were pretty much raised by your Aunt Tilly. I was raised by my aunt, uncle, aunt, aunt and uncle, yes. Right. What was it like growing up in Iowa during that time? Well, eventually, of course, it got interesting when I got into school, into high school, but it, uh, it carried us through the days of the Depression in the 1930s, and I graduated from high school there in 1935. And so you did graduate from high school. That was oh, yeah. a huge... E even then, it, that's because there were a lot of them that went to country school. But Lynn Grove turned out to be one of the first consolidated schools in the whole state of Iowa and had a nice new building in about 1916. So in the 20s, when I, when I was old enough to be, go to school, it was well established and they had buses drawn by horses and... Uh, and uh, and then later automobiles were, and finally a truck with the, with the standard top and so on. But uh, I walked to school a lot because our farm was close to town and I was at the end of the bus route. And if they were late, horse drawn and otherwise, because of the weather, well, I'd take off and walk on the highway and then they would catch up with me and, um, and take me the rest of the way. Great. So you uh, graduated high school, um, what year did you say that was? In 1935. Okay, so in 1935 then, what did you want to do? Well, I guess I had been active enough in extracurricular activities and, and uh, academics, so I was valedictorian of the class that year. And I also uh, uh, was awarded the overall uh, exceptional student uh, award uh, I don't know what they might call it, called it then or what they might call it now, but um, I was given an extra award. And uh, in living and growing up on the farm, uh, one of the connections to Iowa State College we had was an annual visit from the county veterinarian who came to uh, inoculate the, our, our hogs. And my assistance with that and his knowledge of my... Um, uh, um, ability with mathematics and you ought to go to Iowa State and, and be an engineer. So that's where I headed. So in the fall of 1935 I enrolled at Iowa State College in general engineering and found in my curriculum of course uh, required attendance at um, ROTC, basic ROTC. 
And uh, there, that was my first uh, uh, c contact with military service. What do you think of that? Well, that happened to turn out all right because I did well in that and, and, uh, and signed up for advanced military, advanced ROTC in my junior and senior year. And some of that may have been the nice uniform with boots that we were able to wear. And, and also that we were paid a small amount for attending classes and, and spending time in the military. I suppose it was maybe 25 cents a class or maybe, you know, but it was a weekly pr curriculum, of course. But that was the start of, of uh, my military service. Kind of accidentally fell into it and you liked it. Yes, I did. I, uh, I don't know what there was about it particularly, but uh, <laughs> you know, Quite frankly, being in the engineer school, about all I knew about engineers is that they were somebody that uh, piloted a pl uh, uh, yeah. an uh, engine on the railroad. <laughs> and there was a railroad that went through Lynn Grove, so that was the engineer mm -hmm. thing that I had in mind, but uh, that quickly tra changed when I got in college. Yeah. I'm going to scoop my camera over just about one inch. See, that's why I like looking at the camera because I might see something new. Okay. So that's awesome that you went to Iowa State. Right. right. Um, what else did you do while you were at the college? Um, well, I continued my interest, uh, and I guess of the extracurricular activities I had in high school, um, music, not instrumental, but vocal, men's league club, um, uh, mixed chorus, and quartets, and that sort of thing was was. Uh, so when I got to college, um, music became a part of my extracurricular activity as much as possible. But I never was, can I, I never was um, 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 able to learn the, uh, an instrument. It was always vocal. Okay. Um, so your your college years went well. Went well, well, except mm -hmm. yeah, it it went well. Okay. And uh, I I. Uh, I was finally, well, the only honor such that I uh, obtained perhaps was that I was uh, initiated into Phi Mu Alpha, which is an honorary music fraternity. Mm -hmm. And when I was to go back for my last year, I was uh, the, to be the president of the, of the fraternity. Mm -hmm. And what year did you say you graduated from Iowa State? Well, I got my commission as a second lieutenant in June of 1939. Okay. 1939. And then what happened? Well, the, in the senior year, the, the uh, uh, reserve officers had all been sent to Camp uh, Riley, Fort Riley, Kansas, and uh, were for two, year, two weeks of, of training. And then uh, after 1939, we were all sent down there again for a, a little different level of, of uh, training because we were all second lieutenants, you know, and, and uh, still wet behind the ears. Um, what was your, um, as an officer, were you an infantry officer? Or what? No, Corps of Engineers, RO to Corps of Engineers. Okay. So what does that mean your job would be then? Well, it meant, I guess, that we would be in units that would be responsible for perhaps simply building roads and bridges and maintaining them. Uh, it later developed, uh, of course, uh, being involved with river crossings on Ponton bridges and Bailey bridges and, and things of that nature that uh, facilitated the, um, the, the advancement or the movement of of the various military units that would become involved in any any combat situation. Okay. So, of course, in, in 1939, there was a war going on, but the United uh, States was not involved yet. What, I, what did you know about it at that time? At that time, I knew nothing. I mean, really, it wasn't didn't seem to be part of the curriculum in the in military classes. And uh, I wasn't, you know, I just wasn't connected to world activities and wor what was going on in Europe and, and this man Hitler, you know, and 
Um, do you remember at what point you started learning about going to the war and it might become a reality for you? Well, just basically, but I guess I was more interested in, in getting married and getting started that part of my life and going to work for the gas company in Des Moines. And, uh, but so tell me a little bit about that. When did you get married? Well, we got married in August of, of 1940, the, a week after my wife was 20 years old because she insisted on not being a, 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 a teenage bride. Mm -hmm. But that was all right because we'd been uh, committed and, and devoted to each other for three years before that. And, uh, and so we were married uh, here in Des Moines at the Highland Park Presbyterian Church by a retired minister that had once been a, the minister of the Presbyterian Church in Lynn Grove, uh, where we had grown up. However, he hadn't been in our, we weren't there at the same time he was. So, so you and your wife got married and got settled? Got, got married and we settled on, in a one room apartment down here at 34th and Forest. And the building is, the house is still there. And, uh, uh, and, but then in August 1st of 1941, when we had let, been married less than a year, and I had been working at Iowa Power and, or at the gas company for, uh, uh, well, only since March, I guess it was, of 1940, I got my first orders to report for a year's active duty uh, uh, for further training, I guess, is what the excuse was. Yeah. Um, how did you receive that notice? It, it, it's, uh, the copy of it is uh, way back in the beginning there, and it, it was in the mail, and it was from uh, some unit. I, I don't know if it was Second Army, who was a, a uh, not a field army, but an uh, army of engineers in, in, in St. Louis. I don't remember where the source was, but uh, it was to proceed without lay, delay to, camp, uh, to Fort Des Moines for induction for one year of uh, military training. All right, and what did you think about that? Well, making 75 cents an hour and the prospect of being a second lieutenant in the United States Army and having some degree of status uh, that way, it was, uh, we accepted it and kind of look forward to what we uh, we had coming. Uh, how did your wife think? Uh, she was compatible. She, uh, yeah, you know, we, we had nothing else. She was a had, was a registered uh, beauty operator in in the uh, uptown shopping area, and uh, we were we were managing at the minimum uh, uh, of, of, of income, of course. But she was uh, willing to go along, and so we packed up our 1939 Chevrolet Coupe and uh, put a, a um, uh, cedar chest that we had bought, one of the first pieces of the furniture, and it fit right behind the seats and made a nice little shelf back there. And we put our clothes, our, all of our possessions there, and in the trunk, and off we went. Off you are to your adventure. So, yep. um, do you remember what it was like when you initially arrived? What? Do you remember what it was like when you initially arrived at your training? Okay. The first assignment was to Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, where we were assigned to the 92nd Engineer General Service Battalion, colored, if I can use that. Mm -hmm. Because at that time, the, the Army was trying to find uh, types of uh, Army assignments that the colored population that was becoming involved was in. So we went, we reported for duty on a Sunday morning in a, to the battalion that had uh, over a thousand colored troops uh, that had been there briefly enough so that they were a little bit organized. But the first thing we heard was, well, uh, Lieutenant, I'd be glad to give you a couple of three days to find a place for some lodging. But he said, we're leaving to Louisiana Maneuvers at 2 a.m. tomorrow morning. So just like that, I spent one night 
in Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, and I was in the cab of a six by six truck along with a truck full of, of, of troops headed down the road to Springfield and Branston and down into the Louisiana maneuvers. Um, so my, the question that comes to mind is then were you in charge of an entire uh, African American unit? No, I, I was only a second lieutenant okay. in a cadre or an organization of about 20 or 25 white officers and the chaplain was colored. And I and they were divided up into companies and, and uh, you know platoons and squads and so on. So it was the troops. The troops. No, uh, I landed rather early on in headquarters company in the supply department, supply section, mm -hmm. and so a lot of my uh, early experience and through the training that followed was in uh, in engineering supplies mm -hmm. or or supplies that did cover the uniforms and the gas masks and, and everything else, the, the, the uh, arms, the, so on. So how long at that point then were you in the United States before you ended up actually going over to... Okay, after the maneuvers in Louisiana, we were back in camp from about the uh, 1st of December right around Pearl Harbor time until the 1st of January when the entire unit was ordered to Camp Joseph Robinson, Arkansas, which was at Little Rock, North Little Rock. Uh, and there the, uh, the troops were supposed to be trained using uh, bulldozers and graders and things like that to help build the roads in Camp Joseph Robinson so it could be expanded and uh, could take the influx of, of enlistees that were uh, expected to follow the entry into the war. Um, let's let's go back a little bit. Um, so you do you remember when Pearl Harbor happened and how you heard about it and what was going on? <laughs> yes, it was on a weekend. It was on a Sunday. My wife and I had gone to St. Louis to spend the weekend on a, a weekend. Well, it was not a leave, but it was just a weekend. And we were in a movie theater in St. Louis when the announcement came on the screen and uh, with the orders or the suggestion I guess that uh, military troops should immediately return to their to their quarters or to, to their units and Fort Leonard Wood was maybe uh, 50 or 60 miles west of St. Louis but uh, we got there as soon as we could however the urgency wasn't as as necessary as it sounded you know but you do remember the moment that you Oh, were. yeah, of course. Pearl Harbor, you know. And I was a neophyte in the Army, uh, and that's a Navy place. I have no idea where it was. Mm -hmm. You know, I knew it was in Hawaii, but, you know, the significance of it and, and what, what had been involved in the, in the surprise attack was, uh, was entirely new territory for me. Yeah. Okay, so... Uh, after Pearl Harbor, obviously, then the United States then it, joined the war. It became the really involved, and and of course my year of service was uh, extended and extended and extended. Yeah. Um, so, at what did you have any more training that you needed to do before you could leave the country? Then, well, well, I did a lot of training of troops, and I suppose that was training of me, but to run through it quickly, the next step. In, in my uh, service at Camp Joseph Robinson was to be sent with a cadre of officers and enlisted men to Camp Forest, Tennessee, where we were to organize and train the first colored water supply battalion because that was something else that it looked like that colored troops could, could handle and, and, and so on. So we were only in Camp uh, Forest, Tennessee about, um, well, into the middle of the summer or early, I guess it was maybe June or July, when that unit was forwarded to Camp Blanding, Florida, which was near Gainesville and, uh, and uh, near the University of, of, um, of Florida. And uh, then we went almost immediately on maneuvers into Louisiana, into the Carolinas for two months. 
And uh, following return to camp and further training, um, I was lifted out of the, 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 the battalion got authority to send an officer to Fort Belvoir for field officer training. And I was only a lieutenant at the time. Maybe I was a captain. But anyway, field officers was a major and lieutenant colonel level. But anyway, they chose me to go. Maybe they wanted to get rid of me to go. I don't know. Because we had had our first child then born in, in Florida, or in Gainesville. And it was a son. And we named him Richard D. Peterson II. So then we went to Fort Belvoir, Virginia for uh, several months of training. Well, maybe a half a day. Well, we went there in October and we were done in Jan July. So from there, then I was reposted, not back to my original organization, but to a new engineer uh, combat battalion training unit in Camp Breckenridge, uh, Kentucky, which is west of Anderson and across the river from Evansville, Indiana. And uh, I was with them then in training, and, and I, I had served as uh, for them in uh, as adjutant, which is S1, and S2, which is intelligence, and S3, which uh, training, and uh, so on, and S4 again, that was supply. And so I had, again, some, some exposure to supply, engineering supply. And then in, that took place until May of 1944, when I received out of the clear blue sky orders to report independently unattached to the uh, New York airport uh, port of embarkation for aerial transport to the combat to uh, London England well overseas it didn't say London mm -hmm. so in getting my wife had followed along most of that time but we had to drive overnight in our little car clear back to Lynn Grove Iowa where I had a sister and brother-in-law where she could stop and then go on to Lynn Grove and in the meantime, I got on a, 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 a Pullman train at the uh, depot, Rock Island Station, south of the courthouse down here, and uh, headed for New York City all by myself. Arriving in New York City, I uh, reported to the Aerial uh, Air Force or Air Transport Command, it was called in those days, for transport to overseas. Um, do you remember what you were thinking? That was a long train ride. Uh, oh, yeah. What, what were you anticipating? Well, I don't know how, um, I don't know that I was particularly um, um, concerned about what I was getting into, but the fact that I was doing it alone was, um, you know, without other troops around, and I was, in, as I say, unattached. Uh, I didn't, I'd never been to New York City, of course, <laughs> so that was a big deal, and getting into the, that part of the uh, uh, military, tra military transport system was kind of interesting, and on the orders uh, that are in there uh, was uh, one of the um, Warner Brothers of Hollywood on the same orders that I was on. And he had been commissioned as a, as a, as a uh, uh, I think maybe a major or at least a captain, in the and he was there for publicity purposes or photography or whatever uh, he might be able to add to what the upcoming. And at that point, there wasn't any particular talk about the invasion, you know, but uh, we knew that something was coming. So. Um so you, you made it to New York and then took your, was it a boat that you took oh, overseas no. or airplane? It, it was a lar it was a large air transcontinental, uh, transoceanic plane. And I don't remember now what its name or title was, but I seemed like it was four propellers and a real big plane. And uh, there weren't many people on it except me <laughs> and, and this other. And, and we uh, took off from New York, uh, LaGuardia, late one, uh, one at, not, well, not late one night, but our first stop was in Gander, Newfoundland, for refueling or topping off the tanks anyway, and uh, and, a, and a visit to a, a army mess hall where we were offered 
uh, T-bone steaks and small, well, you know, whatever, you know, and, this, and that was going to be the last meal we had. <laughs> but I had gotten, <laughs> I had I gotten skeptical of flying that much because on one of those sessions in, in Fort Riley, Kansas, we had taken plane flights in open cockpit, cockpit training planes uh, over the prairie out there in Kansas, and I had gotten ill. So I had used a barf bag that was embarrassing, you know, here, you know. So I was afraid that I was going to get ill on this flight on into England. So I didn't eat. Aww. But that was a mistake. <laughs> So what happened then once you reached England? Well, we took off then sometime in the middle of the night and, and, and passed over um, Iceland, of course, and into the northern and landed in, in, in another day, you know, in daylight, in the middle of the day maybe in the northern, in an airport in northern England, and I can't think of the name of that. But uh, that was the end of the overseas flight. And then I got, we got on a smaller plane and flew down to Liverpool and then into Heathrow at, uh, I don't know if it was called Heathrow in those days, but uh, we flew into London where I hitched up with my uh, duty assignment there, which turned out to be the first U.S. Army group, first U.S. Army group, FUSAG, F-U-S-A-G. And that was a phantom, I found out later, was a phantom army full of the regular assignments and, and of, of S1, S2, or G1, S2, and 3. And I was again assigned to the engineering department of uh, that headquarters. Can you tell me, if I was someone that didn't know about the phantom unit, could you tell me what the purpose of that was? Well, the purpose was the Pre preceder or the, but it was also, um, General Patton was around and it was a Phantom Army organization with just enough military activity in the east of France, uh, east of England, to try to give Germany the impression that that's where the uh, invasion was going to come. And supposedly it worked because Hitler kept troops and the, in the Calais area of France, uh, long behind the invasion in Normandy because they could have come down the coast of, of France and, and attacked the flank of, of the invasion forces. Did you know at the time that you were a part of a phantom unit? No. No? No, no, no not at all because uh, we just thought that, that the, the, the operation that was coming up in the invasion was going to be large enough with enough diversification of armies, you know, the first and the fifth and the ninth and, the, and so on, and the British armies and so on, that it needed a, a administrative or a command structure that turned out to be in command of General Omar Bradley. So eventually I wound up then uh, in France uh, with uh, on the staff of General Omar Bradley and the 12th U.S. Army Group. So did you serve with General Bradley then? The, the rest of the way uh, from France on into Germany was I was on his headquarters staff and I think I'm the only I officer from Iowa that was was in that group. But meanwhile, back in London, uh, we did encounter the, uh, you know, a preparation for the invasion, and uh, I, but I still didn't really know much about it and what it was, but I, I always kidded myself thinking, well, boy, they were in a hurry to get me over here before they could start, uh, start the invasion on June 6th. But uh, shortly after that, after the invasion, of course, Hitler began uh, uh, attacking London primarily with his V-1 rockets which were pilotless drone planes called buzz bombs that took off from inclined ramps over in France and at near Cherbourg and flew then level over the city and 
London being a huge, a huge target, it wasn't too bad, easy. It wasn't too difficult for them to uh, run out of fuel and and drop, uh, you know, indiscriminately any place. But it wasn't any military targets they they could reach in that. But they supposedly came over by in the hundreds around the clock from about the middle of June to the middle of July when when we finally moved out of there. But by that time, he had gone to his V-2 rocket, which was more of a mortar uh, operation where it was a high profile and came in to the to came into London uh, more or less silently, whereas the buzz bombs, you could tell where they were by listening and get some idea, and it's when they were headed for you and they, then you didn't hear them anymore that you had to scramble for cover. Probably how they got their name. Yeah, well, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so then, um, then when, uh, how long were you in London? Well, I was stationed there uh, officially until uh, the middle of July. Mm -hmm. But after, after the invasion at, in Utah Beach and, and, and uh, Omaha, Omaha mm -hmm. Beach and Utah Beach, uh, the, the port of Cherbourg, which is is uh, in a prominent uh, in the northeastern part of France, northwestern part of France, was captured from, recaptured from the Germans. Uh, but they had had plenty of time to destroy the port and the, and the um, area where the Queen Marys used to move into the port and pick up fr uh, passengers from France and then go to the United States and back. So it was a Queen Mary uh, port. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, so on the 4th of July, or a little before, just after that port fall, fell, I was um, um, missioned, again, on a solo mission into the combat area in Normandy. And I was flown in in a paratrooper passenger plane or one of the small ones that they jumped out, uh, out of and had used for the invasion on June 6th to fly into... The, to, into um, into the combat zone. And then what was your job there? My job there was to find, make my way in transportation that First Army would provide, mm -hmm. uh, but they didn't. They couldn't. I was expecting a jeep and a driver, you know, because I was a major by that time, so I had a little bit of rank. But uh, they couldn't accommodate me, so I hitchhiked, literally, from Omaha Beach, around behind Utah Beach, and up up to Cherbourg to inspect and examine the port and evaluate how long it would take for it to be put in a in condition so that it could begin re uh, accepting um, uh, uh, military shipments right out of the uh, right from the ocean. You know. How did you hitchhike? Was it with civilians or with military? Okay, the first one was a well, it was all military, but okay. the first one was a a ride in the cab of a, a small convoy of First Army uh, uh, six by six trucks that was to go from Omaha Beach around through Carentan and into uh, Utah Beach where they had been lucky enough to get quite a bit of supplies located and accumulated in that month that, that had transpired. So I was, uh, got the first ride in a cab of a, a Army six by six uh, personnel truck or, or troop or, uh, you know. And uh, the, the first interesting part of that was when we got to cross the bridge at Carentan, there was only one bridge across an estuary of the North Sea and a, a river that was available for transporting and getting across. So when we got within about a block of it, we were halted in this little town and we had to wait until the uh, the bombing of the German army which was continuous mortar and artillery not continuous but but spasmodic spor sporadically enough and uh, so when it was our turn to go we blew, uh, ho and across the bridge and into Carentan and then headed north up to uh, Utah Beach and past uh, St. Mary Glees and on up uh, into the town of Sherborne that had just been captured from the Germans.
Which is your final destination? That was my final destination. But on the way, we stopped at the uh, uh, an engineering dump on the uh, behind Omaha, Be uh, Utah Beach, and there I ran into an officer that had been in training in in Kentucky, mm -hmm. and some troops that were there, and so I got a, a ride then from there up to Cherbourg in a in a three quarter ton uh, personnel carrier they called called it, and uh, got into Cherbourg then. Uh, all by myself, and in the uh, in this military truck. Um, and then, what did you find once you got into Sherburg? Well, into Sherburg, of course, it was devastated because the Germans had been there long enough to to really intentionally blow up the big cranes and the docks and the the wharfs and the keys. Q U A Y Q, <laughs> and terminology that a little farm boy from Northwest Iowa didn't understand or know at all. And I was really, I don't know, well, any, how I, I know how I fell into the assignment, but, but uh, that's another story all by itself. But I got there and I spent three or four days um, uh, talking to the already uh, par uh, port uh, reconstruction people of the army that were there, the quartermaster people there that were getting ready to accept shipments off of the troop ships that would be coming across, examining uh, of interest but with no particular value, the the submarine pens that the uh, German uh, military had constructed in the port so that they could come in uh, in the, you know, and, and be and uh, re-supplied uh, re, uh, and then get back into the English Channel uh, without uh, being on the surface of the... Okay. So, so there were... Uh, their um, Navy uh, submarine pens, they called them, and they were something like that, but they were well below the level of the sea, and I was down there in those, because uh, they didn't really enter into the what I was needing to find out because we weren't going to do any under uh, under the water. Everything we were going to get was in ships and, and had to be to the to the docks and to the wharfs and to the big cranes and so on. But I did have a, 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 a an interesting half a day or at least with the mayor of Cherbourg driving a U.S. Jeep <laughs> and who took me around the whole town and, and showed me what, what, what had taken place. Um, how long were you in Sherbourg? I was in Sherbourg then over the 4th of July. I would, I would say something less than a week. Oh. But it was over the 4th of July uh, of 1944. And then I had to hitchhike my way back to, to, um, to Omaha Beach to pick up a, 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 a paratrooper plane to fly back then to London and report to the uh, uh, headquarters of FUSAG. And I thought of kind of an interesting question. While you were doing all of this traveling, what would you eat? Well, there were uh, army messes along the way, you know, mm -hmm. part of the people who, who captured the town. And then they, they moved in and, and took over a little hotel. And then they have a mess there. But I, I was uh, just eating uh, what I could. Uh, out of my mess kit <laughs> uh, in an army mess that I happened to be uh, connected to. Okay. And then you would sleep wherever? Uh, well, when I got to Sherbrooke, well, I slept on the ground in, uh, in, uh, in, at Omaha Beach because that was still a combat zone and I slept there in a, uh, I don't know if I had a sleeping bag really or not, but, uh, and then when I got to Sherbrooke, the army already had uh, commandeered, I guess, and although that's not quite the word for it in a friendly company, a country, uh, a hotel. Mm -hmm. And so I, I had hotel accommodations there that was run by the some part of the U.S. Army. Um, so you got back to London, and then uh, what happened while you were there in London? Okay, when we got back to London, then I had to make a report, and I, I had no camera, I had no a notebook, I had, had nothing, and I had to appear at, at a meeting uh, with more three, 
three-star, multiple-star generals, and I had to, to tell them what I had found. And basically, it was, it was simply a, a uh, uh, evaluation uh, gleaned from the port repair people that it was going to be at least 30 days before they could expect any any shipments to come in off of the off of the ocean and get into uh, and get a, be accommodated in the harbor, but that wound up eventually being a gasoline and fuel shipments getting in there, and then of course the, all the quartermaster stuff that they needed and the and the ordnance of of uh, artillery shells and uh, ammunition, and at, at one point then when that did start, why the uh, these uh, uh, they started or initiated the Red Ball Express, where these uh, tr um, six by six uh, trucks would load up with five gallon cans of gasoline and head back down to Carantine and Omaha Beach and, and so on, and then got in behind the breakthrough and followed it on, on across northern France. But that was the Red Ball Express, operated primarily by the colored troops who had become trained or, or organized into transportation companies and battalions and so on. And then eventually they, drew, they built a pipeline that laid on the top of the ground and down through Cherbourg and uh, St. Mary Lease and then through Carentan on past Omaha Beach and, and then on east into France uh, as, the, as the front finally extended in August beyond Paris. So you found that um, the, the colored soldiers that you were with were finding their place? Well, not the ones that I w was with. Oh, okay. See, not, the, not that, that group, because that general service, those people uh, concentrated on, on uh, the, the bulldozers and the graders oh. and, the, and so, the so on. Another... And then there are other ones that, that got organized into Ponton. Uh, bridge companies where they could build Braley bridges and they could put pontons in the river and have a, uh, a, 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 a cover, a treadway on it and so on. So for uh, river crossings? For river crossings and stream crossings because the Germans destroyed the bridges and, and before that uh, our Air Force had, had intentionally destroyed bridges so the Germans couldn't get back to Germany. But uh, so there were a lot of bridges and small river crossings that was necessary that the engineer corps uh, troops, whether they were colored or white, uh, handled. So um, let's see, where were we before we started talking about that? Well, we were back in London, and I guess I got to, off into the uh, off into the buzz bombs and, yes, uh, and yes. so on. Yes, right. and, and then we talked about, the, but then in July, okay. uh, the 12th Army, well, the troops that were FUSAG were moved into, um, into, the, into uh, Omaha Beach, and we landed in uh, troop ships and uh, uh, landing craft, crossed the beaches and into a, a holding area uh, somewhat north of, of St. Lowe, but... Uh, and here, if I had the maps I've got on my wall, I could show you just exactly where it is. Because in my house, I've got a, a, a room devoted to maps and so on that I could explain all this and, and maybe make it more interesting and educational. But uh, that's a little bit beside the point. Um, so you were the entire time you were overseas, were you in the FUSAG? Well, FUSAG and its organization evolved into 12th U.S. Army Group. About the first part of August, about the time that General Bradley advanced from in command of the Omaha or the invasion troops to invasion of, of the troops that were going to uh, break through and go into Paris and across northern France into Germany. So that happened in, in the early part of August, about a month after we after we uh, landed in France. So um, as the infrastructure of Europe started to rebuild, what was your role over there? <clears throat> well, we weren't around. We were beyond that. When, the, when, when St. Lowe was devastated, there wasn't a, an, uh, 
well, everything, houses, buildings, everything, churches, everything in, in Fort St. Lowe was, was pretty well destroyed. But we were beyond that then by that time and would advanced into Verdun, France, and were quartered there in a World War I French army base, or caserne as it was called. And we were there from September of 1944 until May of 1945, all through the Battle of the Bulge and, and all through all of that. So you were there actually stationed there for a more significant amount of time? For a significant amount of time. What was the living conditions like there at that Fort Cern? Well, it was an old World War I Army barracks mm -hmm. and, and fort and uh, parade ground, not parade, well, uh, athletic fields and barracks all around and mess halls and... and uh, Did you have opportunities to travel um, to do... Uh, to travel outside of the area to do your work as well? Well, or maybe a little bit before the, the, uh, the things that happened in Normandy mm -hmm. after we were there and the, and the breakthrough and the big armada of, of planes that got followed up instead of going, well, and here again, if I could, if we just had a map, just had the map, and I, I wish you could had, had, might have time to come and see that because, but anyway. But getting back to your question, uh, during the time that we were in, in uh, Verdun, the, the uh, Battle of the Bulge, of course, took place on, from the 17th of December until about this time in January of 1945. Uh, and there we were close enough to, to um, the nuts, <laughs> the nuts, uh, McAuliffe, and the, and the town in Belgium that I can't now on the tip of my tongue can't think of. We had some opportunity to to travel, and, and uh, but one of the things we discovered it was that. The organization that had been uh, put together for the 12th U.S. Army Group became somewhat ineffective as far as getting anything direct accomplished because the other organizations at the Army level and the Corps level and the, and the battalion level managed very well their uh, getting equipment that they needed when a, when a bridge, when a river crossing was uh, necessary or when um, and I wish I could think of that town that was so prominent in the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, B, 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 Bastogne, oh. Bastogne. See, if, you, if I gave you a second, I knew you would have thought of it. Yeah, Bastogne, yeah. Uh, that was not too far from, from Verdun, and we were on alert to move if we had to out of Verdun. But like in World War I, Verdun never got invaded by the German army. Even in World War I, it was the one place where the Germans just never got into. So, hmm. um, so were you ever allowed opportunities for R&R? &R? Not really, except uh, there were... Uh, some business trips necessary from Verdun into Paris because there was a large army call, uh, army units in there called ADSEC, Advanced Army SEC. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, well, anyway, there were a lot of things, <laughs> troops that uh, that were quartered there in because it became a, a focal point for transporting or, or getting troops in from Amer from uh, the states and uh, back of course into London and back to the states for as um, as injured and so on mm -hmm. so there was some there was some need to go back and forth but as far as the supply area this engineer service section that I was in command of involving about four officers and and a half a dozen or more enlisted men really was never able or required to accomplish any 
procurement or or expediting of engineering equipment and equipment and allocating it to the first army or the fifth army and so on to to back up a uh, a, a military uh, uh, mission. Uh, so there was a lot of troops there, quite frankly, that really weren't able to accomplish very much. And that would make your job more difficult. Well, it, you know, it was, <laughs> I was one of those where it was boring to death mm -hmm. because there wasn't anything we could do. Mm -hmm. The only thing that we really got involved with, and that became uh, a little bit superficial, was that after uh, the Battle of the Bulge, all of those troops that had been involved had a lot of lost equipment. Uh, you know, not only guns and tanks and so on, but we got an order to make an estimate of the replacement requirements that we needed to get back to the United States to the manufacturing to where they could uh, uh, expedite or increase their production of uh, this kind of supply or that kind of supply, whether it was, it was Ponton Bridges or whether it was Billy Bailey Bridges <laughs> or China Marking Pencil. Mm -hmm. So we had to go through the table of organization and the list of things that all these units uh, had and just make a guesstimate of how much it would be and compile compi compi that for sending up through uh, channels so that it'd get back to the United States. But other than that, a uh, brief period of time, uh, quite frankly, we, we just didn't have anything we could really uh, sink our teeth into. What would you do with your time? <laughs> well, not much because we were uh, limited to quarters. We, we did our calisthenics. We played volleyball in the in the uh, in the parade ground or the you know and, and uh, but uh, we just went through the motions every day uh, keeping track of uh, uh, of what advances the armies were doing and what where they were getting into trouble and so on but there wasn't anything that we could really physically uh, accomplish to help them would you have opportunities to send letters to your wife well yeah we always had that uh, the uh, the little things you know the little uh, uh, v mails they call it and and letters and we got some mail from home of course and and uh, but um, how, and sufficiently so I guess uh, how about care packages uh, the U the U S O had uh, operations there the Red Cross people had operations there were a lot of that mail and that, that uh, support for the troops uh, was handled, uh, none of which we got involved with really. We have passed up one interesting little thing oh, we from, can go back. from way back in Normandy, however, and I have, have it here to show you. That is an attempt at psychological warfare. It's an attempt at psychological warfare that were dropped, airdropped on the troops in the beachhead area in Normandy, uh, encouraging the soldiers to, to, uh, to uh, surrender, surrender, mm -hmm. and become prisoners of war. Because on the back of this is our letters from from soldiers that were already prisoners of war telling them to not worry about them, that the, the, the German people or the troops are taking well, good care of them and so on. And, and so if you'd, rather, if you'd rather be alive than dead, crippled, or a prisoner, why uh, just uh, surrender. But Sounds that was, easy enough. That, that would be enough. You know. <laughs> but that happened back in Perrier, which is west of, of, of saint lô just before the breakthrough, which occurred with a big bombing, uh, and, uh, Air Force bombing on the 25th of July. But um, the, the communications that are, are uh, purportedly something that they wanted to send uh, from Germany because they're prisoners, then back to their families in the United States. And that's the basic of the basis of the uh, messages that are on the backside. 
Okay. Oh, and what did you think about those when they started? Did well, they come out of the they air? Came, they, came, they were dropped, air dropped, uh, by small planes uh, because really the Luftwaffe didn't have much air support or air combat into, in the Normandy area. They had a few fighter planes, but nothing like bombers. And, uh, and, and so there really wasn't, a, there was one overnight occurrence that they had an observation plane that flew slowly over the Omaha Beach area and they called it Bed Check Charlie. You know, every night at a certain time, even when I was there uh, in the first army uh, bivouac, bivouac was that, that plane went over and <laughs> nobody bothered to shoot him down because it was a plane only about the size of a Piper Cub and uh, so why waste ammunition on something like that? Well, that's beside the point. And he was, well, that's an interesting story, though. I, I always like all the little... It, it's an anecdote or anecdote. Uh, you know, I, yeah. do, I do like anecdotes also. So uh, let's get back to where we were before. In, in, in Verdun. Yes. You were uh, stationed there and dealing right. with boredom, if you will. Yeah, um, b boredom, really, and not much you could do. And we were... Uh, we had no particular reason to be out wandering around, but but all of the officers, officers took advantage of that to some extent, and got up into Bel uh, into the Netherlands and, and so on to Maastricht and uh, and uh, uh, around in the zone that had been the Battle of the Bulge, and I had one interesting family relation. Somehow I was able to find uh, uh, contact with. Uh, some of the other people from Iowa, from uh, Lindgrove, Iowa, who was in the army, and had come in through the south of France, in France, France, and had worked there up into, uh, well, areas not too, uh, Liège, no, Liège isn't right, uh, Le Mans, and, uh, well, anyway, I got to meet with one of the, a couple of the soldiers from Lindgrove, that were in units that had been in Africa and come to Italy and up through southern France. And uh, one of them turned out to be a, a, a family member now and is still living in Storm Lake. But he had been a, uh, uh, involved with the delivery of mail mm -hmm. for his unit. And, uh, and then he came back to the States and wound up being a rural American mail carrier for 30 or 40 years. There you go, yeah. I, uh, but that's about the only thing. And I did run into another uh, family, a cousin, who was a pilot on a Black Widow night fighter plane that was, uh, stand, uh, was uh, uh, their unit was on, on uh, Etain, E-T-A-I-N, which is a small town on a big prairie, a big flat area, just east of Verdun. And he was a pilot on that, uh, and I got to see him talk to him. And got the offer of another ride that I didn't, <laughs> that I didn't accept. <laughs> so how was it to see those guys? Well, it, it was it was real interesting, and now it's real uh, mystifying how we were able to make contact because communications weren't all that great. You know, telephone lines uh, were were run by you know over the ground, and radios were. Uh, not very well operated or very well, uh, very dependable. So. Hold on one second. Stephanie, I can hear you. Can you hear her talking? Hmm? I can hear Stephanie through your microphone talking in the other room. Oh, is that right? Yeah. There we go. Thank you. Oh. Uh, she's going to keep talking. Well, are we uh, um, wandering off into... Oh, you also said um, after the war, then, mm -hmm. we, we were given leave. Um, that, I suppose, would be even in May or it wasn't July, where we were flown down to uh, Cannes and the uh, Riviera area of France for a week or so of, of leave, mm -hmm. which was kind of interesting. Um, what, what would leave entail? What would you be allowed to? Well, in, in that case, we were flown down in these, these paratroop planes, mm -hmm. and, and I mean through the Alps, because we were in these 
if you could look out the side of the plane, we could look up and we could look down, and we were going down the, going down the, uh, the valleys of the Alps, and and uh, for a guy from Iowa, that was quite an experience. Yeah, that would. Be. And and then the con area was con, and uh, there was uh, activity that we were holes, uh, we were quartered in a nice hotel and had mm -hmm. had nice dinner. Uh, uh, facilities and so on. And then, of course, flown back to Wiesbaden. By that time, though, we were in Wiesbaden. After Verdun and after the war was over, we, uh, after the war had ended, we were moved to uh, Wiesbaden, which is a, a very nice uh, ca uh, spa area of, of Germany. Mm -hmm. yeah. Isn't that kind of closer to the Alps? No, that's on the north part. Oh. It's it, it, it's north of the, on the Rhine near uh, mm -hmm. near Frankfurt. Okay. It's near Frankfurt. So uh, let's. I'm going down my mental checklist of just what I'd like to get a good idea of just what your life was like while you were in the war. But I think you know we talked about mail. Did I forget anything? Well, it was pretty routine, really. Uh, because of the, I would say, ineffectiveness or the uh, need not to be involved in the combat areas. Uh, I didn't earn any uh, Purple Hearts. I was never wounded. I, was, I don't know that I was any any, any great danger, except perhaps on the on that special mission from London to to Cherbourg. But um, uh, there wasn't a lot. Uh, the mess hall was well operated, uh, you know, we, we had regular meals and uh, mm -hmm. the, the quarters were these old rooms that didn't have any heater but a, but a stove, a wood burning stove. The shower wasn't uh, uh, very accommodating, uh, that was in a separate building of course, but um, and the latrines <laughs> were, <laughs> were a little uh, crude, you know. Um. Even though you had this, um, if you may have talked with some of the infantry soldiers, did you ever feel that you were lucky? Oh, I always felt that I was, was lucky, really, and, and disappointed to the extent of, of not feeling that we were able to accomplish anything that we're really contributing. And, uh, but, uh, uh, and some of the, of course, one, see, this headquarters got to be rather large. And of course, a lot of the officers took advantage of, of uh, the freedom that they had and the, the visitations that they could work up and the, and the uh, trips to Paris and, and things like that. So it, it, it became, um, if you were interested and able to do that sort of thing, why, uh, um, life wasn't all that bad, you know. Sad, but it's true, really. Yeah. Well, I, most guys that I've talked to, the, they understood that they were in a pretty good place. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. It, it, was, it was only the, and there weren't really, well, there were front lines in a way, but not to the extent that it was in World War I when there were trenches and, uh, and you know, uh, a lot of uh, discomfort and... Uh, no good place to get anything to eat and so on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was, it was, it wasn't plush by any means, but it was, uh, it was, uh, it was comfortable. Uh, so, can you, is there anything in your notes that you wanted to talk about that we haven't discussed? I don't want to talk about you going home yet until we've covered everything that happened during your time overseas. Oh, overseas. You don't even want me back in Fort Belvoir yet. We, we'll get there. Uh, yeah, I just okay. want to, sometimes when we talk about Fort Belvoir, then it's like, oh, I was going to go back and tell you about something in Normandy. So we'll take care. If there's everything taken care of overseas, then we can move on to uh, going back. Well, we talked a little about the V-1 rockets and the, and uh -huh. the, and the V-2 rockets, pilotless mm -hmm. planes. And the Phantom Army in London, of course. Did you ever, at, do you remember at what point you found out what the Phantom Army was all about? 
Well, I didn't really get a, a good explanation of that, I guess, until now in later years. Uh, really, when we were involved, uh, it wasn't uh, uh, any priority. You know, I suppose some of it was secrecy, so there wouldn't be any leaks to to the uh, German intelligence that uh, we weren't really, and it didn't really amount to anything, that uh, we were just a... Uh, an organization with lots of names and but not a lot of people but uh, but uh, but Patton did a good job because he was flamboyant enough and so on so that uh, when he was out in in the Calais area of, of eastern England uh, and there you know they had lots of dummy tanks uh, that were uh, you know complete uh, made of rubber or something you know, but they just had enough of it out there, so Hitler didn't uh, apparently realize that that wasn't where the invasion was going to take place. And really, there weren't any ports in that end of England that would be capable of, of, of loading troops and loading ammunition and tanks and so on and, and get them across all that water and, and to land on the beaches in, in where we did land. There, and you see, Dunkirk had taken place. The British Army had tried an invasion of of, uh, of the continent across Dunkirk uh, a year or so, at least, before uh, World War, uh, the uh, Operation Overlord. So, uh, and that had been a disaster. Uh, do you remember any other anecdotal like? stories that you wanted to share? Did you want to take a look at your notes? Well, I don't know. I, I, re I wrote one that is going to be a part of, of my Richard's ramblings. Then I consolidated that into these pages, and, and that doesn't amount to anything either, and, and other than the fact that uh, this morning I finally realized there's nothing in here about the medals. Wait, look, oh, right. Don't drop Oop. that. I don't want that. Oh, yeah. There we go. Uh, if you'd like to talk about that, we we could talk about no, that. No, okay. no. All I all I all I received, of course, was the the regular uh, regular Victory in Europe awards. I got a, earned a bronze star and a French Corps de Guerre, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, those were kind of <laughs> officers' good good. Good conduct? Good conduct medals, you know. Mm -hmm. you know. They really didn't amount to much. Okay. Well, then, if we've talked about all your experiences overseas, let's talk a little bit about how you got back to the United States. Okay. On the way, on when we came back, I came back with another officer because the two of us had been ordered back to Fort Belvoir. And so we flew into Paris from, uh, from um, Frankfurt or from Wiesbaden, and uh, then we made our way with military transport to La Havre, where, we, where there was a, a port uh, on the northeast west coast of France, La Havre, uh, where we were at a, at a fort for a few days until we got a troop ship to get on, and we rode back to America in that. How was that? <laughs> That was all right, and I didn't need a barf bag, or I didn't need to go, go to go to the rails. But we came back on that, and one inter kind of interesting little sidelight, but it's more personal, I guess, so it could be deleted. Uh, was that the other officer that went with him back with me happened to have been in England for almost two years before he had he'd been an earlier, and he had got well acquainted there. But he also picked up uh, uh, an affinity for gambling. And that continued into Germany, or into France. But anyway, on our way back, he had accumulated a lot of money. And so I wa I, he gave me his, metal, his uh, what is it, money belt, his money belt. It was filled with thousands of dollars of money for to wear back with him, so that he wouldn't get involved with uh, gambling on the 
on a ship and, and lose it. <laughs> um, I forgot to ask how many years in total you were overseas. Well, I was over there 14 months okay. from May of 44 until July of 45. 14 months. So were you able to keep that money safe? Well, I mean, I mean yeah, I mean, because I didn't, didn't travel in that crowd at all. <laughs> but I wore his money belt with all that money on me all the way back across the ocean. And we pulled into the New York Harbor across and were greeted with the, the fire hoses on the, on the tug ships and so on up the Hudson River to, uh, to uh, West Point, where was our disembarking place. So that was the first place where I ate a steak dinner and enjoyed it. <laughs> and then we got back into New York and took a and and uh, took a plane, uh, took a train to Philadelphia, and met his wife there in a pickup truck, <laughs> and then drove on into Fort Belvoir uh, with his wife, had an overnight stay someplace along the way, uh, but then into Fort Belvoir. Was your wife able to come? Visit? No, no, she wasn't there any time after I went to New York for, for transporting. She'd been back in Lynn Grove with our, uh, our son, a year and a half, two years old. Stayed with Grandma and Grandpa. Uh, but she then, no, I didn't meet her until uh, we came home, went home for the 30-day leave that filled up August and ran into the end of the war in, in uh, Japan. But uh, in, uh, interestingly, I had been able to spend VE Day celebration in Paris in all that wall-to-wall -wall people from the, from the, well, down the Place de la Concorde to the, uh, well, anyway, just, you can't imagine all the people from France that were, were there that, that night, and uh, that was indeed uh, an experience. Well, then in August when I was home, we were here in Des Moines when the VJ celebration took place. And we were at the Kirkwood Hotel down here when the streets were full of, of celebrants here. But that was just a little um, dampened by the fact that my wife's only brother had been killed in the battle at St. Lowell and wasn't back or wouldn't be coming home. So that kind of put a damper on that celebration in Des Moines, but uh, but you were home. But I was home, mm -hmm. yep. and I got involved with both both celebrations. Uh, what was it like seeing uh, Richard Jr.? Oh, <laughs> well, we met. Phyllis came to Chicago in a, on a train from Storm Lake, and then when we came back, uh, uh, my our son. Pete, little Pete, he was known. I was known as Pete in the army more than Dick, for Peterson, um, and I would have been continued that except there was already a Pete Dion in the gas works. So, well, anyway, but we like we came back to Storm Lake then, and, and my uncle John A. that had raised us, raised me, and little Pete were there to meet us uh, at the at the um, depot in Storm Lake, in a. Uh, I guess it wasn't the Model T at that time, but anyway, we uh, he drove us back to Lynn Grove, and then we were there for about a month, and then back to Fort Belvoir for discharge or decision as to whether I wanted to return, remain in the Army from then on out, and, and we had just enough... Um, you know, being a civilian during that leave time, and I did have a job to go back through to at the gas company, so that's what I did. The end to my military service then happened in the nine year in the nine years after that, where I tried to half-heartedly keep active in the Fort Des Moines Engineer Corps, uh, Reserve Officers. Are, well, it was kind of an uh, well, it was an engineer battalion, and I was, as I said, half-heartedly interested in that until 1955, when I was a battalion commander and really didn't have any troop command experience. 
I'd been an executive officer, which is the second in command of a, a, that 172nd in uh, Breckenridge, uh, Kentucky, but I really hadn't had a lot of troop experience because it had been in, in the, in the administrative branches, particularly supply. So they <laughs> wanted the engineer battalion from Fort Des Moines to go to Camp Fort Fort, Fort, Riley, Kansas. Fort Riley, Kansas. <laughs> and uh, somehow I couldn't see going back there again. And at the same time, Iowa Power and Light uh, didn't have a plan to allow me to take leave and go. I had to take vacation and with two sons to uh, spend vacations with and, and spend our summers with, I just gave up and retired uh, in 1955 with about 17 years of experience <laughs> and no pay. Wow. So that's about it. You still got three more years in you? Huh? Well, let's go down and enlist you right now. You can spend three oh, more can years. Oh, can I, can I re-enlist? Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, I think that's going to be about it, Richard. And okay. If you have anything else, I'm going to stop the recording now. Okay, good enough. I've done a lot, done and said a lot more than I thought I was going to be able to say.